welcome to Inside Minneapolis. I'm your host, Phil Lindsay, and I'm here at the historic Whitney Mill Quarter along the riverfront in downtown Minneapolis. And for this edition, we're going to be talking with the head of a city agency and a very important office here in Minneapolis. But first, let's go to our monthly feature, Did You Know? And it has something to do with the historic Crown Roller Mill right over my shoulder. Stay tuned. And we're here at uh, the Crown Mill Quarter, and uh, the image you just saw is of the Crown Roller Mill, which has an interesting history, in addition to the fact about the construction you just saw. Uh, in its time, it uh, was unique partly because it had a decorative roof treatment, which was unusual for an industrial property. And also, um, it happened to be built on a promontory, the highest land mass right in that part of downtown Minneapolis. So it was really a prominent building in itself. Well, I'm very pleased now to introduce to our viewers um, a man for whom I work. I need to disclose that. Uh, Steve Kramer is the executive director of the Minneapolis Community Development Agency. Uh, in other words, he's the jefe de jefes as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and uh, it's an important agency, obviously, it goes without saying. But for those viewers, Steve, that maybe don't know a whole lot about what the MCDA is, could you just outline for us its basic mission? Oh, sure, Phil. First of all, it's great to be with you. Beautiful day, beautiful setting. Nice place to be, <laughs> isn't it? Indeed. The uh, MCDA is really the housing and economic development arm of city government in Minneapolis. So we are an independent organization. We're not created by the city charter like the Public Works Department or the Police Department. We're created by a special state statute that brought together the many different elements of community development uh, that existed prior to 1981 when the statute was, was passed. But that, that statute brought together all of the powers of housing and redevelopment authorities, public housing authorities, uh, different entities to do housing and economic development work. Right. So Which all the city had been involved in. That's right. City had been years. involved through uh, the, the old uh, Minneapolis Housing and Redevelopment Authority and, and successor organizations that are literally go back over 50 years now. Yeah. So in one way or another, MCD has been around for over 50 years. Yeah. But in 81, all of those functions got consolidated. We are responsive. We are governed by the city council and the mayor. They are our board of commissioners. Right. And some of the actions that we take actually have to be approved both by the council sitting as the council and the council sitting as our board of commissioners, depending yeah. on, on what the nature of the action is. So, uh, But we do uh, housing development, we do business development, we do residential finance, help people with mortgage loans, housing rehab loans. Uh, we own property throughout Minneapolis, uh, including prominent properties like the Milwaukee Road Depot, which is being renovated right now. Yeah, as we sit and speak. That's, that's right, that's yeah, right. Going on the Greenbelt Brewery, which we hope will be renovated in the very near future. Uh, uh, prominent properties like Block E downtown, yeah. and literally hundreds of lots throughout Minneapolis that we yeah. hope will be redeveloped as, as housing or other productive community uses. And part of the balance there is, is the revenue streams that come from some of these different developments in terms of the agency's ability then to put money into other kinds of programs. Yes, that's right. I mean, some of these uh, properties that the, uh, the city acquires through MCDA really are meant to preserve our history. Uh, others are meant to uh, control strategic land that then can be redeveloped in a, in a positive way for the, for the, for the community. Uh, but in doing that, we're able to derive some revenue that can then be plowed back into our mission elsewhere. Right, and I know that over the months that we've produced this show and I've suggested to someone, oh, meet us at such and such a place, They'll say, oh, I, I know that place because that's where I came and got my home mortgage sure. money. They may have a very sure. personal relationship right. with the MCDA. Yeah, that's right. On the other hand, you may have an entire neighborhood that has a, a working relationship with the agency in many of its departments. That's, well, that, that's right. We really are involved in activities throughout Minneapolis, yeah. so it's a pretty broad reach, I think. Sure. Yeah. Um, you started your particular position here about a year ago. That's right. Um, any thoughts on your first year? Any <laughs> milestones uh, that you, you might have passed yeah, or uh, yeah. seen the agency engage in? Uh, well, it's been a very interesting year. Uh, I think we've, we've, we've accomplished a lot, and I don't take any credit for it. We have a very dedicated staff of about 165 people who work extremely hard uh, under a set of circumstances now where uh, the workload is very high because the interest in developing in Minneapolis, whether it's real estate development or 
new business activity is, is very high as well. And so as, as that interest increases, our workload increases. I think our, my overriding philosophy has been let's take advantage of these opportunities. And so I think the level of activity from MCDA has, has, has reflected this strong interest in investing in Minneapolis at yeah. this particular point in our history. Uh, well, so that, that's an overriding impression that there's just so much to do and we're trying to take advantage of as many of those opportunities as we can while the good times are in place. Exactly. Um, well, home ownership. I mean, uh, the things you see in the media and the studies that are reported uh, is, is way up. Yes, that's People right. People are investing in homes. Well, and we just had a report, uh, an evaluation report of the Neighborhood Revitalization Program, which again, the MCDA has been intricately involved in showing a very high level of satisfaction uh, on the part of Minneapolis residents with living in city neighborhoods. And I think the NRP is a part of that, but so is the MCDA, and I think sure. we should all feel good about that particular finding uh, of that survey. Well, NRP, and that's the Neighborhood Revitalization Program, uh, which is now at about the halfway point that's right. in its 20-year uh, intended history. Right. Um, would be one of the partners yes. with which the MCDA works. Yes. Can you just outline briefly kind of the, the, the relationship between NRP? I mean, I know there's a, there's a financial and then a, a, a project relationship. Well, the, the NRP program, Neighborhood Revitalization Program, is a 20-year commitment to spend $20 million a year really through the community development finance system that, that uh, the MCDA controls. Uh, on neighborhood determined uh, development and community building priorities. Uh, so the funding for the NRP really flows through our community development finance system driven largely by the success of downtown projects over the years. Um, and the contracting and administration of the NRP also flows through the, the MCDA. And many of our staff, our project managers in housing and economic development and residential finance and business finance work closely with the NRP staff but most importantly, neighborhoods doing their NRP planning to help conceive of programs and projects and to help implement those programs and projects. So we've been closely involved uh, with NRP right from the start, and I hope that relationship can grow even stronger as we enter into this next phase of the, of the, pro of the program. And on a practical note, although they happen also to be housed in the exact same building yes. we are, they really are two separate two, entities. Two separate organizations, mm -hmm. there's no doubt about that. The NRP staff is more a community organizing, kind of facilitating uh, function, which is, is very important, uh, but then we need to step in and play the more uh, technical role, whether it's in terms of accounting and administration or in terms of helping programs and projects be structured and implemented. Um, to get back a little bit to this year that you've, yes. you've been with us here at the MCDA particularly, um, any surprises? Any surprises? I, I know you've had a long history of being involved both at the policy level right. and now at the implementation right. level. Yeah. Anything that surprised you? Well, I had a pretty good idea of what I was getting into because <laughs> I did serve yeah. on the council for 10 years and also was uh, uh, closely, worked closely with MCDA when I was out, out of the uh, out of City Hall working for That's a right. nonprofit community organization. Yeah, very community oriented right. uh, organization. Right, sure. worked closely with MCDA. So uh, I think, uh, again, the, the, the biggest surprise is just the the, the pace of the work and the level of the activity, and I think that's a reflection as much as any uh, of anything uh, of the, the current climate we find ourselves in Minneapolis. Sure. Yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, as you look to the future, and, I, and you mentioned M uh, NRP is, yes. is they're kind of at a, at a swing point now in a way. They're right. sort of reevaluating yes. some of its relationship yes. with our citizens. Similarly for MCDA, do you see some some new trends that, that you as a director or yeah. maybe the agency ought to be uh, attending to? Well, we are putting in place a new strategic plan for MCDA. Mm -hmm. We've been operating under a plan for the last five years and we've done some work this year, as you know, to mm -hmm. get some outside eyes looking at what we do and also intensively within the organization ask ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, how can we be a place where people can do their, their best work? So I think some of our challenges will be those internal challenges. And how can we make MCDA a, a highly effective organization doing this important mission? How can people come to work and really feel motivated and, 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 and rewarded by, by what they do in what sometimes can be a very challenging environment? We sure. work in a political environment. We sure. work for, for people who are elected officials. We, we work closely with neighborhood groups, and, and sometimes that can be a, 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 a rocky relationship, but it's one that we have to continue to work to improve and, uh, and fine tune. So I see some of those internal organizational challenges as an important priority for all of us in the, in the mm -hmm. coming year. Well, you've got to keep the troops motivated in order yeah. to get out there and do that heavy lifting that they're, right. they're here to yeah. do. And sure. It really is about you know, all of us who work at the MCDA 
uh, feeling motivated and feeling rewarded by what we do uh, and, and feeling like what we do makes makes a difference and having people tell us that every once in a while. Yeah, so yeah. that's that's what we're well, trying to do. It's, it's my sense and here I am speaking as someone who's worked in the public yeah. sector in a couple of guises but uh, anybody that works in the public sector has a, has a multiplicity of, of bosses as it were. Yes. I mean obviously there's the organizational boss but you have the people that you think you're there to serve as well. Someone used the image once, uh, what if you had a phone with a number of buttons on it and you knew where the calls were coming from, a neighborhood person, an elected official, and you know, your administrator, right. which one do you pick up first? <laughs> well, that's a good point. Because you, know, yeah. uh, yeah. you care about all of them. That's right. And it's all necessary right. to, to be yeah. there. Yeah. Um, not to go too far afield, but you're a man who travels, you're, you're a professional in the field. Can you describe your impression of what we're doing here in Minneapolis vis-a-vis -vis other cities across yeah. the country, other communities? Yeah, well, my, my sense is that uh, Minneapolis is experiencing many of the same uh, overall trends that other cities are. Some of those are good, some of those are not so good. I mean, we are, we are seeing a return to Minneapolis. I mean, we're sitting here looking at uh, oh. literally uh, uh, condominiums and loft apartments that sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, and there's a market for that today when there wasn't five years ago. And so Absolutely. that's a good sign. That's yeah. a positive thing going on in the city. Two miles from here, uh, in either direction, we would be in the midst of neighborhoods that are experiencing more poverty than they would have five years ago, as well as significant trends of, of migration and new arrivals coming to our community who have something to offer, but who, uh, for whom we have to work hard to find and help them find a place in our community. So we're experiencing the good and we're experiencing the challenges, as are all cities around the country. I think what we have is an ability to deal with those trends perhaps more effectively than other cities because we still have a very strong economic base. We have a strong tradition of public participation and civic engagement. Uh, and so I think as we look to the future, we, we really face those challenges and opportunities from a, a base of great strength. And many cities don't, don't have that. Yeah, from my background, I work often in the hospitality, arts, yeah. entertainment arena. And I know that Minneapolis is blessed with, I think it's described as one of the 24-7 City is one right. of the few that has a yeah. very vital downtown, for yes. instance. And I think we tend, certainly those of us that work here, I think, and live here, tend to look inside out. I mean, we know what's next door, we know what's downtown and in the neighborhoods. Yeah. But when you get the broader view, maybe we're taking some of what we have here for granted, the success and the opportunity. Yeah, I think, as I say, we, we are, we're a, a successful city. There's no question about that. And we look to the future from a position of strength. I think the flip side of that is to always worry about complacency. Yeah. And there are many exciting things going on across the country that we can learn from, mm -hmm. just as communities often come here and learn from us about some of the things that we're doing well. So it's that, that uh, tug and pull of, of, of not being satisfied uh, with what is, but recognizing that our, our current position is pretty strong in relationship to most other cities in the country. Mm -hmm. And a good engine here in Minnesota as well. Yes, oh, of our partners. very much so. I mean, yeah. it's clear that downtown Minneapolis is the driving force of the regional yeah. economy. That's yeah. positive. Uh, in our neighborhoods, as I said earlier, the level of satisfaction of people living in our neighborhoods is, is quite high. And so those, yeah. are, those are good things. And it seems to be trending upward increasingly. So. But as you say, we must not forget the fact that as many of us are experiencing some good things, there seems to be kind of a drag yeah. on, on folks who aren't quite as fortunate. I think that's a that's a focus that, that we've tried to, that I've tried to bring to the agency too, and I know people within MCDA agree right. that that while the times are good overall, right. our unemployment rate is at, at historic low low levels. For instance, there clearly are pockets in our community that are not experiencing those good times, and yeah. part of our priority should be to extend the good times, but to sure. also uh, help broaden participation in this uh, wonderful economy that we have going now. Well, and you, you bring that up, and I, the macroeconomics are important. I mean, what's yeah. going on uh, in Asia yeah. or the global market, and certainly this dynamo that is the American economy right now is pretty impressive, and here we are. Let's capitalize. Right, right. Let's bring up just a couple of topics, and, and I'm not asking you to solve them here in a moment, but employment and, and, and affordable housing. Those, yes. those, in my opinion, from my experience, cannot be solved within the limits of one city's boundary. How do we, as a public agency, mm -hmm. in a given city, how do we engage with the rest of the forces that need to be dealt with? And, and maybe if you can outline a little bit in our case, who some of those players are. Yes. Well, in the area of, of housing, we work uh, closely with the Metropolitan Council, with the State Housing Finance Agency, with uh, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, our congressional delegation. All levels of government really have a, a responsibility, I think, uh, to focus on this issue of broadening housing 
choice, uh, not only in Minneapolis to address some of the urgent needs, but to recognize that Minneapolis can't be the only place that's addressing this issue of affordable housing, and it really has to be a regional a response, and the federal government has to be a stronger player than they have over the last 20 years or so. The state, to their credit, has been stepping up over the last couple of legislative sessions and have made more significant allocation of resources to help address the housing issue, not just in Minneapolis and St. Paul, but throughout the state and throughout the region. We haven't seen an equivalent uh, priority established uh, at the at the federal level, and, and that that needs to happen. So part of our work has to be advocacy, in right? That, in that and area. those shifting political trends too. I mean, a, a generation or more ago, the feds helped Minneapolis be on the cutting edge of some right. urban development That's and right. things like that. And That's then right. things, as you say, change. Yeah, and really, a it's really a bipartisan statement that withdrawal has been across Republican and Absolutely. Democratic administrations. Right. So it's something that yeah. just has to be hopefully put in. in clearer focus in Washington for all cities in the country. On the employment front, uh, I think our role there really is to recognize that we have business relationships with employers, whether we're helping them with their real estate needs or their business finance needs, and that's important. But increasingly, many of their challenges are in the workforce area. And so if we can help leverage our relationships with employers uh, to extend to helping them meet their workforce needs, working in cooperation with many partners, whether it's the city employment office or training institutions throughout Minneapolis, we'll both be helping businesses succeed, which is our main mission, but doing it in a way that perhaps addresses some of the unemployment issues in pockets of our community. Good point. Uh, speaking of history, let's take a little historical tour, at least for our viewers here, and get some, a very nice montage of some skyline Great. shots Great. showing uh, Minneapolis's downtown, mostly Good. in this instance, kind of evolving from, I believe, the late 20s. Okay right up through the 70s, yes. about that time of change we were talking about. Right. And one key factor, uh, viewers, you'll notice in there, somewhere in each of these images, the Fauché Tower. <laughs> See how it changes around there. And while they're watching this, we can continue to talk Good. a little bit. And Steve, I want to get a little personal, because I know that you're a man of commitment um, to the people of this city. I mean, you, you've certainly been a public servant, and as you mentioned, you worked <clears> uh, with a nonprofit organization that was really heart and soul, I think, about helping people in their housing and their, and their community needs. What are some of the principles and values of Steve Kramer, the person ah. that you bring to your job? Yeah. Well, I hope that uh, I reflect a commitment to my work, that mm -hmm. people can see that I care about what I, what I do. Uh, I hope as a, uh, as a manager or as someone who is responsible for helping to administer the organization that I can support people in the work that they do. I mean, that's, that's, that's so important. I don't want to ever be the, the problem or the place where uh, people in the agency are, are running into a roadblock. We've got enough roadblocks elsewhere that you don't need it to be Good point. Uh, for, for me. <laughs> sure. uh, I also do care a lot about this community. It's been my home now for uh, you know, almost 25 years. It's where I'm raising my family and uh, it's a great place to live. And you know, I've been really fortunate to be in positions to uh, help kind of address some of the, the needs and, and issues in this community. And I'm glad to be uh, in yet another position where I can do that. Well, that's great. Um, when all is said and done, and years or months from now, when Steve Kramer says, I'm ready for my next challenge, what might be the legacy you'd like to leave behind <laughs> from your days with the MCDA? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I don't mean to pin you down at necessarily sure. one specific sure. project. Sure, but sure. Well, I, I hope that I can look back and others can look back and say that we did take advantage of this extraordinary time to you know, move the city forward and to address some longstanding development priorities. I hope we can look back and say we did that uh, while at the same time addressing some of the equity issues within the city, kind of addressing the, the, the problem areas and the pockets of poverty. And I hope within the organization I can look back and say I, I left the MCDA as a kind of a stronger, better place to work than, than when I came here. Because I, I think that's always a process of evolution for any organization. And if I can contribute towards that continued evolution uh, in a positive way, then, then I will feel as though I did my job. Steve Kramer, yeah. thank you very Good. much. Thanks, Phil. Pleasure to have you on the yeah. show. You bet. Well, I'm excited uh, for our next guest to come here. It's a woman with whom I've worked over the years, and anybody in Minneapolis watching this show needs to know more about her. But first, we're going to hear from our host here at our wonderful site here by the Crown Roller Mill. We'll be back right after we hear from Julie Langer. Hi, my name is Julie Langer and I work for Welsh Companies. We manage three properties here in the Whitney Mill Quarter area. And one of the reasons I like working in this area is it's a beautiful area combining the past with the present. 
The mills have been turned into office buildings, and if you like to jog, walk, or just enjoy your lunch in the outdoors, it's a beautiful scenic area. So if you get to tour the Whitney Mill Quarter, we hope you enjoy your visit. I, just, I never know how that happened. <laughs> And we're back and we want to thank Julie. Um, those of us that had the chance to spend some time down here in the Whitney Mill Quarter, it's just a thrilling place to, to work and to come down and recreate. And by the way, we're right out here in the wonderful courtyard of uh, the restaurant here that's been hosting us. So many thanks to Julie and the folks with Welsh Companies. My next guest is a woman with whom I've both worked and uh, I've known her for a number of years in a couple of different roles. Edie French, nice to have you here. Thanks. Edie heads up video services. Can I get like the matrix from you? I mean, is that? <laughs> the matrix? Yeah, I mean, video <laughs> services. I mean, I've been looking for that old Buster Keaton movie. Wow. That's not what you do though. No. Um, well, first of all, Phil, I have to say, I'm just delighted to be here. It's a very odd position for me to be in because as uh, director of video services, I'm usually in the background somewhere. So it's feeling what it's like to be sitting in this chair. <laughs> well, usually if Tomo kind of was pulling the curtain, you'd be behind the curtain. <laughs> That's right, that That's would right. be me. Yeah. Um, video services for the city of Minneapolis um, brings to you most of the things that you would see on City Cable 34. We produce the city council meetings, which we consider to be our bottom line. If we did nothing else, right. um, we would be bringing people the decisions that are made uh, by the city council Which, if I may city. interject, I mean, that's literally the reason I got cable in the first place. Is I'm just one of those people that wanted to watch the city council meetings. So, in addition to that, we have several studio shows that we produce inside Minneapolis, this being, being a location show right. that we do on a regular basis. We also have um, a show that you also host called Artifacts. We have a public health journal which deals with public health issues in the community. Um, MPD Live, which is a call-in show for the Minneapolis Police Department. People can call in and talk directly with representatives of the police department. And that particular police show deals with issues and things that are going on within the police well, the, context? The focus of that one is primarily community crime prevention. Okay. So it, it's the, the goal of that program is to create a dialogue with the department and the citizens and look at ways that they can join forces together, that people can help themselves to prevent crime yeah. before it's happening, what to do in the so event of a crime. Exactly. And I'm really making the distinction between that show and another, I think, high-rated show that you've been associated with, which is the 10 Most Wanted. The, well, yes, and that's part of our program called Eye on Crime, which is hosted by Deputy Chief Jones. Um, that program, uh, we've been doing a uh, for a little bit longer, it looks at um, the, the workings of the police department. We do a, a department a feature highlight every month, as well as look at the 10 Most Wanted, and we have gotten We've gotten calls. It's it's actually the Twin Cities Ten Most Wanted. So um, okay, so they, a little Hennep wider than Hennepin, just Minneapolis. Yeah, Hennepin County puts together a list of those people for whatever reason are are wanted in the metro area, yeah. and we have been instrumental in um, by virtue of people seeing them on seeing a familiar face on the air calling in and saying I saw that person. An interesting story about that is um, one of my favorites is um, shortly after we had aired. Um, comments about one of our 10 most wanted being seen in Florida someone called and said that they had spotted her she called in and said who's been ratting on me no. <laughs> how, how did they know I was in Florida she called in and they were able to track the track the phone call and, and they nabbed her? her yeah yeah they she was just what kind really of really cranky I don't know and I guess she it, called in and then they nabbed her because of her call yeah and then it, it apparently it doesn't take a big brain to be a criminal in some cases apparently <laughs> so. not I mean that's like a burglar picking up a ringing phone and saying exactly. hi burglar here <laughs> exactly so wow so so fun. apprehensions have uh, have, uh, have occurred and and uh, rewards paid as a yeah. result so and you do other um, I guess what I describe as occasional things, police graduation events and other sort of recognition. Right. Um, our, our goal is pretty much to cover the city business. We yeah. um, produce programs at the request of city departments. We've done things, um, everything from garbage, to, excuse me, garbage carts to teen pregnancy to programs about the parks. Um, neighborhood festivals, neighborhood I think festivals I've seen. Neighborhood festivals we've done. Can't forget City you know, Beat. City Beat is one of our shows, Mayor's Roundtable. Yeah. Um, Does she actually have a round table? The round table is kind of a concept and as our set changes <laughs> over the years, it's, sometimes it's a metaphor for discussion, yeah, round table discussion. Sometimes we actually have a round table in the studio. Yeah, I think so. the one time this show did a round table was actually octagonal or something. Yeah, so, you know. People have to ha give you a little flexibility. Well now, you know, as we're continuing to talk, if they haven't already run it, um, your crew is going to put together kind of a pastiche 
of some of the uh, some clips from some of the shows you've been talking about. Um, so that's a major challenge. I mean, that right, that's enough to keep you busy right there. All these productions. Absolutely. Yeah, but that's not all you do. No, that's not all. It's not. You <laughs> maintain the formal relationship that the city of Minneapolis has with, I guess I'll just call it the cable provider. Right. Um, which is Time Warner. Exact. At this point, it's Time Warner. Point. Um, we have, the city of Minneapolis has a, a cable franchise. It is actually Appendix H of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances. And it's, <laughs> it's a book about this thick. The interesting thing, and th the interesting thing about it, and when I first came into this part of my job, I was reading along and I read through chapter one, which was this thick. I started moving into chapter two, which is this thick. And I thought, ah, I've read this somewhere I mean, these before. are chapters of? The Code of Ordinances. Okay. It's Appendix A, ch Chapters 1 and Chapters 2. So the, the appendix is that big? The appendix is about this big if oh you print it all word. out. <laughs> um, Just the relationship with the cable provider. With the cable provider. Wow. And originally, going back probably almost 20 years, um, there were in fact two cable providers in the city of Minneapolis, thus Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, because each of those companies held one of the, one of the, one of the chapters was there. This is sounding almost their apocryphal franchise. here. <laughs> now, I remember 20 years ago when most cities across the country had not been cabled yet. Okay. And there was this kind of gold rush stampede towards cable as, at that time, kind of the big new platform. Exactly. I and mean, this is pre internet and, in some ways, pre personal right. computer, too. I mean, they were out there, but cable was seen as the new way that every home in America was going to be hooked up and just about every industry was going to have a shot at providing, I don't know, their goods and services through cable. Goods and services through cable, um, and a, as well, just a, a, you know, the range of programming options. I think in those days, um, 60 to 80 channels weren't uncommon. With real um, content. With content. Yeah, I and mean, they were actual, dreaming about maybe 500 channels that are and, and those 500 channels are becoming more of a reality yeah. today as we speak. Um, one of the things that cable companies brought to the table to offer cities to say, we want to dig up your streets. We want to provide this, not only glut of programming, but glut of advertising, glut of information to your Which citizens. Which is their revenue stream. I mean, that's Which, how they were going to make exactly. their money. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but at a, at a certain cost to the community. Sure. Because face it, whenever anybody is doing business, they're digging up the streets, going and knocking on your door. There's, there's an impact on the community. If only repairing alignments. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but one of the things that cable companies brought in and, and offered to cities is, okay, we're going to bring you these um, 80 channels of commercial programming. Where's the balance? Where's the voice of the community? And in having access to all these commercial channels, wouldn't it be great if your community had a voice as well? And right. so as part of the cable franchising, cable companies offered um, channel space, equipment, funding to train people in the, to provide the resources and train people in the community to produce programs that reflected their community to go on the channel. Sure. It's, it's the concept that, that gives us the city council meetings, that gives right. us um, festivals that are produced whether by my office as part of the government access or by public access. Um, so it's really a very rich opportunity. It's the, it's the public benefit to this not insignificant private gain that the and, and for most of the time it's been a monopoly. Is that changing a little bit? That I, I think that that will change. Uh -huh. um, currently, as I started I mean, saying approved. before, at, at one time there were two cable yeah. companies, and I, I think at that time uh, one found that they really, that there wasn't the market here in Minneapolis. Apparently we have a lot of people that read a lot of books, <laughs> that do a lot of outside activities that we don't have as high um, degree of people who want to watch TV as there are in other places. I've heard places. that there were slightly less cabled than some than other, other cities. places. The, the dynamic that's changing um, is that something called convergence, and it's the ability to offer not only cable TV over the cable TV lines, uh. but also things like internet access, telephone services. Right. And so right now we're seeing a resurgence of interest in this area, and in fact now in Minneapolis we have um, received applications from two additional cable companies to provide those services. Mm -hmm. and, and that to me then would imply a change in the formal relationship with the current provider, which gets you back to your chapter and verse 
you know, in your appendix here. Your well, somewhat, but not really, because any other cable company that came in would be subject to the same okay. requirements for street um, street oh, maintenance and repair, as well as offerings for the public right. service, uh, the public access support that the current company is is required to provide. Okay. When you just mentioned the public access, but that's really broken up in a variety of ways. And I think when most people think of something that's produced locally and you see it on your cable, that that's, oh, that's public access. Right. But that's only one slice, if you will, well, of acro community across the available. Across the country, it's actually referred to as something called PEG, PEG? access, PEG, P-E-G. And that's public education and government. And here in Minneapolis, the public access portion of our PEG resources are provided by MTN, Minneapolis Telecommunications Network. And they again provide training and equipment access to members of the public that want to come in and, and produce programs about their life and their community and to have that seen on the cable channel. Right, provided they have a certain level of technical capability, right? Well, the train they, they work with some people. Training? Yeah. yeah. Well, they provide training. You have to yeah. go through the training in order to use the equipment. Right. And, but then and it's yours to engage with and tell your story. Exactly. Yeah. And there's um, our freedom of speech um, allows people to um, pretty much say and communicate what what they want want to about wow. their community. So that's the public. Yeah, that's the P and that's, peg. That's the P and peg. Then we have education. And in Minneapolis, um, the Minneapolis Public Schools provides most of the educational access. They have a production facility at the educational, uh, um, at their 807. Up on uh, Broadway in uh, Northeast Minneapolis? Exactly. Um, they also do a lot of work in the schools to teach kids about media literacy. Oh, classroom oriented. Cla oh. Classroom oriented things. Okay. They have a, a television program at North High teaching students there about television production. Is that the media um, magnet, more or less, at North? I think so. Because I know they that do would, the KBEM right. radio up there as well. Right. Also telev television, television production yeah. facility. Um, so I do see a lot of wonderful shows on that particular channel. Now, our viewers in Minneapolis see us on City Cable 34. The, uh, the school's number is, what, 35? 35. 35. Uh, and then MTN actually has a kind of a string of... Uh, potential uh, channels. Right. Uh, the, the, the number of channels available for public use right now um, also allow us to provide access to some of the colleges, um, some of the oh. higher, higher level education. Okay. Well, that's, so, which would be included in educational access as well. And that's well. all still part of the E now. So we've got that the P, the we've e. got the E, and then there's good old G. <laughs> and then G. And um, in Minneapolis, the, the G, the government access is provided um, through my office, um, Office of Video Services, and the um, we have our cable channel 34. Right. So, and bottom line is through through those three, um, you pretty much get a picture of Minneapolis yeah. and the the people that live, work, and play here. It's interesting. Um, somebody doesn't just walk into. Um, City Hall Video Services and sit down and say, hey, now I have this job. How'd you get to do what you're doing? Well, that's pretty much how it worked. Is that it? <laughs> the empty chair uh, and a motor. There was a need and I was there to fill it. <laughs> you're the last one to back away. And they said, we really need somebody to go watch uh, our relationship with Time Warner there. Huh? Yeah. Actually, no, it was a slightly more complicated than that. Um, I actually, I mentioned the North High program. Mm -hmm. When I was back in high school, there was a television program at the school I went to, Marshall U High. And I received a little bit of television training there. There was also a program called Film in the Cities through an urban arts program where... The, the, the late, great Film in the Cities. The late, yeah. great Film in the Cities. And non profit arts organization. That's right. Yeah. And when it was in downtown St. Paul, they took kids from all over the city and taught them about, in those days, filmmaking. Yeah. Um, and you did this as a high school? I did that as a high school student. student. And wow. so I, my, my interest goes way back. I also took photography, so I've always um, had a, a leaning towards the visual arts and for a number of years was um, an independent producer. Um, I was an artist in the schools for a number of years through the Minnesota State Arts Board. and, and In that medium? In that medium, in yeah. film, and, and then later video. Right. Um, I worked on a film in Europe, and it was actually a film um, in the early 80s, came back to the United States, and at that time, 
started realizing that video was really the way to go. <laughs> what what made was, you think that? I mean, just that it was more accessible, that there would be more of it, or what? Video is a very accessible medium. Yeah. We, film was very expensive to um, to purchase, mm -hmm. to produce. Every frame was and, and uh, maintained. was was critical. Yeah. <laughs> it got scratched. It was yeah. a very textural yeah. medium, yeah. Um, and and very expensive to yeah. to be involved in producing. Um, and I mean, it's a very beautiful medium. It's a wonderful medium. Do you feel there is a qualitative difference? I mean, the, the cliche is is that when you see something that's on film, there's somehow a different dimension and warmth to it. Video is a little more brittle. Or I, I think the technology now is so developed and so changing, yeah. and, and quite frankly, my life these days is more about the information and about the content. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there are just so many exciting and wonderful things to do in video yeah. that, you know. Theorists can argue. <laughs> go out and talk. And of course, they can now, go out and talk about. <laughs> much of this is getting up to digital now too. Right. Uh, which I hear is also making it more accessible now for people without as much money to maybe go out and shoot those movies uh, with the digital equipment, yeah. things like that. So video is a very accessible medium, mm -hmm. and it's, it's you know when you tie that in with the the access through cable, mm -hmm. it really is. It's a, it's a wonderful ability to have a local voice for things. I mean, in, instead of big commercial companies being the only ones that could afford to produce materials, create ideas, communicate ideas, regular people can do it. And you mention all this excess, and it's a wonderful mm -hmm. thing, and it leads me off to two sort of divergent questions. One, how is it governed? There's got to be somebody looking at this and saying, we're comfortable with this or we're not comfortable with that. How does that happen? No, can I, what is question two? Can I see if I want that one? <laughs> I'll hold that one back. I don't know how much time we have. No, but there must be somebody that, that sits, not in judgment. I mean, we have freedom of speech, as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. but, you know, the community values probably intersect somewhere here at some point. Well, I think that that's a very interesting relationship. It's an ongoing discussion, and I think that's one of the primary reasons for having public education and government somewhat separated. Um, just because the, the public's need for speech, um, the public's right to speech, shouldn't be controlled. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't really, I mean, who is to decide? On the other and hand... And you're talking content here. And I'm, and I'm particularly talking content. When you get into the regulatory arena of monitor, there's a lot of discussion now about taking the ability to regulate the cable companies, to regulate the technology, away from the local level, um, but you have some very bottom line simple things like our streets. Well, yeah, again, that you have still an infrastructure yeah. <laughs> going into the streets. You have um, you have you know people tearing up people's backyards. You have citizens that are paying money with possibly nowhere to turn if they have a complaint about it. Sure, and local service and the quality of service and issues like that that are consumer exactly. citizen concerns, sure. The second question I want to ask you is that we have this, um, let's call it a platform, it's kind of a cliche, but there are a lot of possibilities here for people to create content. Are people making use of it? I mean, I know here we are, we're sitting in a show that we do and we're involved in others and your studio creates a lot. I mean, I actually think that City Cable 34 produces quite a palette of, of interesting and useful shows. Are the pu other public access uh, elements, the E's and the G's, are we getting enough content out there? I, I think there could always be more. Uh -huh. I think with the resources that people have available to them, it's a pretty busy frontier. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that um, you have folks at MTN who are working with the public day in, day out, and if you ever have the opportunity to go over there and, and um, they're housed in St. Anthony, Maine, and they have a very active production facility. Um, we have this show is also seen on on our regional channel six Metro Cable Network. There's a production facility there a, across the the metro area across the country. There are production facilities where people are. So people shouldn't programs. be shy about taking the. I mean, the facilities are there, and, and the, the equipment's there. Get out and make use of it. Exactly. Yeah. Edie French, we're just out of time. Nice to have you on the show. Thank you, Phil. Thanks a lot. Well, I'll be back uh, in a little bit to talk about our What the Heck feature. But first, um, let's take a look at a wonderful montage of some images, historical images of Minneapolis neighborhoods. They're very interesting. Stay tuned.
And welcome back. You're watching Inside Minneapolis. I'm your host, Phil Lindsay. And what we just saw was a wonderful montage of some great neighborhood shots throughout history. I particularly like that one uh, looking at Lake Street, I think in the 1970s. It really shows what Lake Street was at that point. Well, we're out here in the uh, courtyard to the Whitney Grill in this wonderful area. And our monthly feature, uh, What the Heck Is That?, happens to be not too far from here on the riverfront, uh, right off the river road. And I know I've driven by and said, what the heck is that? Let's go out on location, get some wrong answers as to what it, the heck it really is. It looks like abandoned farmland near the river. Um, burned out ruins. I don't know. Uh, the power tour at Valley Fair. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's uh, when the Vikings came through here and settled here. I think that's some uh, ritual place where they put on their horns and just did some kind of dance or something. I would say uh, a boat, yeah, an old uh, boat launch. Looks like a tower, a water tower at one time, or some type of a transmission tower. Uh, that, to me, it looks like a uh, decrepit. Uh, Looks like a river side port like area on the east coast. I would say it looks like maybe part of an old bridge. I think that's the leftover of of a old structure of a building or something like that. That was this you know was torn down and that's what is left over. I think it's Newt Gingrich in disguise. It looks like a burned out tower, bottom of a burned out tower. It's somewhere over by the river. <laughs> it's like railroad ties just stuck up in the dirt upward, maybe. It kind of looks like an old bed frame, an old rusty metal bed frame. I don't know why it would be out by the river, but that's what it looks like to me. Oh, let's see. Uh, probably a, kind of a power line structure. Something they should throw away soon. It looks like maybe a children's playground thing that went bad a long time ago. Well, those were interesting, but they were all wrong. Now let's go hear from a fellow who knows what the right answer is. Robert? Hi, I'm Bob Klaus, and I'm head of the archaeology department at the Minnesota Historical Society. What we have back here are the supports for an old railroad trestle that supplied grain to an entire two city blocks of uh, flour mills. Uh, and after the, the mills finished processing it and producing flour, the, the material went back onto the railroad and back out, distributed all over the world. This is the reason why uh, Minneapolis became known as Mill City. And these iron structures sticking up out of the ground are sort of the center point for a new development that's going to be begun this summer, next month as a matter of fact, and um, it's going to be the center of a new city park called Mill Ruins Park that will focus on the history of and the remains of those industries that helped to found Minneapolis. This picture shows some of the remains that we currently uh, know exist in this area and are likely to be the same things that will be uncovered in the next few weeks. Thanks, Robert. I, for one, wanted to know what the heck that was, so appreciate your answer. Now, at the end of our show every month, we have a catalog of useful resources, and alongside that catalog, we've got a great image of Old City Hall, dated from 1895. And alongside the credits, by the way, a wonderful image of a couple of Minnesota kids and a pumpkin. Don't miss that. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Inside Minneapolis. If you'd like to find out a little bit more about it, call our hotline, 612 673 2234. And by the way, a website you can access us on is in the credits. I'm Phil Lindsay. We'll see you next time on Inside Minneapolis.